I used to work at CERN, and I still go out and work there a lot. So I work on their data, and I work on uh, mathematical models of particle physics uh, and, how, and forces and the early universe. And m my area of work is really between the data and theory, trying to inform one by the other and sort of bat things back and forwards. Um, and up until last year, I spent all my career work working on the supersymmetry theory, which is a theory of uh, particle physics. And, uh, but we, we thought that the Large Hadron Collider experiment at CERN was going to produce particles predicted, new particles predicted by the supersymmetry theory, and it hasn't. They, this, this hope hasn't panned out. So I've kind of shifted what, uh, what I'm working on. But uh, the supersymmetry theory was beautiful to work on for a while. It, was, it had very lofty ideals. It, it, was a, it was a bridge to theories of everything, um, theory, like mathematical theories of all particles and forces, um, which tr tried to explain everything about our universe. So um, you know, dark matter, how forces work, what, what we're ma made of, um, you know, what light is, everything. Um, but you, the problem with them was you had to make quite a lot of assumptions um, to, to predict just a few things that you could measure and test in an experiment. And then we looked in the experiment and they weren't there. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so I had to rethink last year. Um, and now I'm working in a different mode. Um, I'm looking at the data and looking for glitches. Um, so we predict with the standard model of particle physics, that's the current knowledge that we have. Uh, we predict how the data should look uh, from the collisions uh, between two protons at, uh, at CERN at high energies. Um, and we look for cases where the, the model disagrees, the prediction disagrees with what's, what's seen. Um, and then for the, that for me is an opportunity. So then we, uh, we jump on that and try and explain it, but explain it in a very simple way. We kind of just bung in an extra force or an extra particle that would explain the, what's seen. Um, and then we do some proper phenomenology. So we, we uh, try and suggest other ways in which it may be tested. We first of all check that it's consistent with all other data um, and then suggest other ways you can sieve the data to um, look for these new particles or forces. Um, and then, uh, you know, go one step further in the theoretical direction. So this is more we call it bottom-up um, science, working from the data and where you've got really solid foundation and you think you know what's going on, and then um, making hypotheses away from that. Um, so I'm enjoying this uh, new way of working. It's certainly quite different to the previous way where you try and solve everything um, and make loads of assumptions. That's That we call top-down, you know, it's like you start from pure th thought and then try and get to experimental uh, observations. Um, but for me, anyway, that, that, that approach hasn't panned out. So uh, you know, I'm trying a new approach and it's, uh, and it's a lot of fun. So this change in starting from the data rather than theory, does this mean that you've sort of given up hope of finding supersymmetrical particles? No. <laughs> okay, so is the work still focused on supersymmetry, or you, that's just a belief you have, but you've kind of like... No, I, I, okay, so looking at my own work at the moment, the way, the way I answer this question is, the way for me to make progress right now is not to work on supersymmetry. And the reason is because we know from the data that the Large Hadron Collider has seen already, that in the next few years, there's not going to be a big discovery of super, supersymmetric particles. Otherwise, we would have seen small fluctuations in the data already. So in the next years, for me, that's not where the discovery is going to be, so I'm looking elsewhere. But still, you know, you can't help in your heart of hearts um, believe in this beautiful theory which explains um, a really important fact um, that uh, we otherwise don't understand. And that fact is, um, why is the Higgs boson so light? So if you, if you do calculations on Higgs bosons, um, they're, they're affected by quantum fluctuations, the, little, the seething of space-time in terms of other particles. And they're, they're special in that they feel those fluctuations extremely sensitively. And if you do back-of-the-envelope calculations, those fluctuations should increase its mass by 
something like a billion, billion times more than, it, than it's been measured to be. So this, this is a puzzle that we don't understand with our current theory. It's not explained why is the Higgs boson so light and how is it able to stay so light with these quantum fluctuations. Um, supersymmetry explains this. It doesn't mean it's the only, that doesn't mean it's the only explanation, um, but the other ones don't work or, you know, we haven't really found a decent other one. So that's why we were so um, keen on, on it and why we thought we might be able to um, find supersymmetric particles as a signal that the theory was right at the Large Hadron Collider. So, you know, if in, uh, I don't know, five or ten years' time, some signals start appearing from the data, of course, I'm going to jump back, right back on it, right? But uh, for the moment, I think, in terms of progress, it's, it, it's more fruitful for me, personally, to, to look elsewhere. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.